Okay. So today uh, we start a brand new topic. We did four full classes on apportionment, so we're done with apportionment. And the next four classes are all about sequences, which are just lists of numbers. Uh, coming up soon is the deadline for project number two. Uh, that is due November the 5th, which is exactly one week from today. So um, I know that uh, a bunch of us are kind of starting, and I just, again, want to make sure that we're clear that there are a lot of resources that are supposed to make you comfortable, even if you have no experience with Excel. So Zeke, can you share with us how you use those resources? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so the video and the Word doc have like all the commands you need and you can have them uh, on the screen at the same time like Zeke described and just essentially copy the commands from the video or the Word document into the states problem. Yeah. So and a bunch of the things you'll do in the project makes references to where the particular numbers live and where they live in the project you're doing about the states might be a different cell than in the project I show on a video, right? And so on my project, maybe I'm saying, okay, this is the number we want and it's in cell C4, but you got to update that with wherever the information is in the project where, where your cell is, right? But definitely get started if you have not started yet. So that's due one week from today. And that is that. All right, so let's jump in on page 31. We'll come up here to the top, and uh, we'll start with Ricky for one. Suppose you have a round, flat Okay, so here are our bird's eye views of uh, the same cake, but uh, cut in four different ways. So when we have a one cut through the cake, that's this blue line, how many pieces of cake are there? Two, right? And so when, so that's the number that's already in the table. One cut gives you two pieces. Uh, how many cuts are in the next picture? How many cuts are in the next picture? So there's two cuts there, and then one, two, three, and four pieces is there, yes? Okay, now, it is very tempting. The goal is to find the pattern. Find some pattern that satisfies this. But to just say a number goes from 2 to 4 is not nearly enough information to jump into a pattern because the pattern could be add 2 every time, right? Or it could be multiply by 2 every time. Or it could be square the previous number. There are a lot of ways to get from 2 to 4. So we just need to collect some more data. In the next picture, how many cuts? Three cuts. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and seven pieces of cake. So I offered uh, three different patterns. I said just add two every time. Is that possibly the pattern here? Uh, no. Put that away. So is, is it possibly add two every time? No, right, because four go into seven. That doesn't work. Was it doubling every time? Yeah, so like we just, we collect enough data so that we feel like we can say what the pattern is. I don't, I don't know what it is just yet. Uh, looking at the next guy, uh, I see one, two, three, four, four cuts, and then very carefully, and maybe number all these little pieces of cake so we don't miss one or overcount one, uh, count the number of pieces of cake in there. So how many do we find? How much? One vote for 11. Anybody else? 11, okay. And then let's actually play this game going in reverse. So one cut gave us the two pieces of cake. What if we had zero cuts? How many pieces of cake would there be? One massive piece of cake, so there it is. And so now we have all these numbers. And the question is, can you find a pattern that all of these numbers satisfy? So I've got a few folks who see a pattern. Uh, Jackie, go ahead.
four, eleven plus five. Okay, so Jackie says this is the pattern: is that if you go in between two numbers, uh, the way you get from one to the next is by adding the next number in this list in purple. So add one, add two, add three, add four. So then if that pattern works, then adding five brings me to how much? 16. Do other folks see this pattern? So keep going with the pattern. Fill in the rest of the table. So going all the way up to 10 cuts. Okay, so we fill in the table all the way up to 10 cuts, giving you 55 probably very small pieces of cake. All right? So that's our pattern, and that right there, that, that list of numbers in the bottom row is called a sequence of numbers. It's just a list. It happens that there's a nice pattern in this list, but there doesn't even have to be a pattern. A sequence is just a list of numbers. So in the next few classes, we will study these lists of numbers. Uh, let's go to number two for Tony. Right, so your, your sequence might just have three numbers in it, or it could go forever. Infinite or finite sequence. Uh, some notation. Let's go to Monica. Okay, so the idea here is that A1 is the first number in this sequence, and then A2 is the second number, and A3 is the third number, and A4 is the fourth number. And so if I asked you for A5, I'm asking you for the fifth number in that list, but you have to continue the pattern to see what is A5. A5 is 10. Everybody agree? So the little subscript just tells you where to look in the list. It doesn't necessarily give you any way to calculate the number. In this case, it kind of does, but it doesn't always. So it just tells you where to look in the list, and then you write that number down. So let's start looking at some patterns in our list, 2468 dot dot dot. So uh, A2 is how much? A2 is 4, right? And how much is A1? It's 2, so what can I add to A1 to get A2? Yeah, how much can I add? It is A1, it's also 2, right? So this says if you want to get to A2, you take the previous number, A1, and you add 2. Yeah, I want us to write 2 because that's going to be the consistent thing in this one. But A1 is also correct. Okay, how do we get to the third number in the list from the second number? What do we add? We add two again. Do you guys buy it? In fact, this is just a general rule. If you want to know what the next number is, you look at the previous number and you add two. Uh, okay, so my uh, quality up here isn't very good. What does this last guy say? A-N, great. So this is the more general thing. And what we want to do is write down the same kind of pattern, which is to say take the previous number and add 2. Okay, so adding 2 is easy enough. That, that just goes there. But now we need notation that says the previous number without actually writing the phrase the previous number. So definitely A because it's some number in the list. It has to be N minus 1. That's it. Do we buy that? It's a little bit of a leap there. So n tells you where to look in the list. You're looking at the nth number, whatever that is. So if you're standing on the nth number and you want to look one number before that, then it's n minus 1. We see that? So this is always how we'll say something like the current number. And then this guy right here is the previous number. So the nth number is our current one, and n minus 1 is the previous one. It's just one earlier. Okay, let's think of a different way to get this list of numbers, 2, 4, 6, 8, etc. 
So here in the bottom, A1, how much is A1 again? It's two, first number. And, and two is really two times how much? One, okay, that's fair enough. How much is A2? It's four, which is really two times two. And then A3 is really how much? It's six, which is two times three. So do we buy this as a different way to think of the list of A's? Is to just double whatever the little subscript number is? Because right? A4 is double four, and then I'm assuming this last one also says AN. So what are we doubling in this case? It's, is it N or N minus one? Just N, yeah, look at the pattern. A4 was two times four, right? So the purple four matched the little subscript four. Well, three match the subscript three. Jeff, how are we doing? So this is really a different way to think about this list of numbers. The way that we wrote up here in red said, if you want to know the next number, you add two to the previous number. So starting at two, if we add two, we get four. If we add two, we get six. If we add two, we get eight. A different way to think about that same list of numbers is to just say, whatever number you want in the list, if I give them subscripts, A1, A2, A3, and A4, whatever number you want in the list, you just multiply two by the subscript. So I could get the number eight directly by just doing what times what? Two times four, which doesn't rely at all on knowing that the previous number was six, agree? This is really a different way to think about the getting the, the numbers. Okay, next page. Oh, I think, we, did I skip a definition here? I did, uh, sorry, between five and six, we need to read some vocabulary. Let's go to Sue Ann. Uh, this is called. Okay, so the this is referring to the thing that I've just highlighted. So the recursive rule says that a sub n is equal to a sub n minus one plus two. And the word recur, you know, from uh, outside of math context, recur means to happen over and over again, right? Like a recurring theme. So the idea here is that if you want to find a number, you have to add two to the previous number. And if you want that number, you added two to the previous one. So the, the recurring theme here is you just keep adding two, but the only way to get to the hundredth number in this list is to add two and two and two a bunch of times. Uh, as opposed to this guy, uh, which I'll highlight here in blue, if I wanted the hundredth number in the list here, I would just have to do two times, two times 100, right? If I want the hundredth number in the list, I can just get it directly by doing two times 100, which is 100. And so that has a different vocabulary name associated with it. Let's go to Jackie. Okay, thank you. So let's take a look at this table of numbers. I'm giving you a, uh, n going from one to five. Those are just counting. Those are like my subscripts. And then I'm giving you s sub n is the numbers that are in the bottom row. Now the notation here is the same as before. It's just this, this particular sequence is called s as opposed to the other one we studied, which was called a. It's just giving a name, but the s isn't really relevant. It's just a name for the list. So uh, can we figure out what s sub five is? Tony says 7.5. Agree? Disagree? Tony, how did you get 7.5? Right. We just keep adding 1.5. Is that what you said? Oh. Mm hmm Here? Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, that's totally fine to go diagonally. Uh, I'm not sure which pattern you. 
I can't see the pattern that you're seeing because because uh, I, I see the first diagonal goes up by 0.5, but the next diagonal seems like the numbers are equal. Not that there isn't a pattern there, uh, just because I can't see it. Uh, okay, so somebody else, how do we get 7.5? Okay, so we see that there's a consistent difference here because we can just keep adding 1.5 over and over again, which gives me seven and a half in there, fair? Okay, so we just found this one, and let's use good notation here. So start getting used to writing a letter and then a little subscript down below equals 7.5. So let's think about that. Uh, can we just look at the pairs of numbers in the columns and find a different rule that just tells you how to get from the top number to the bottom number? And Zeke is saying if we multiply. The top number by how much? 1.5. Then we get the bottom number. So let's see if that's true. Uh, if we multiply 2 times this consistent 1.5, what do we get? We get 3. That works. How about 3 times the 1.5? That's 4.5. And then 4 times 1.5 is 6. And so that would be another way to go from 5 to 7.5 is to multiply by 1.5. So we're going to write down uh, both of these ways. So uh, let's just quickly fill in S sub zero though. How much is S sub zero? Yeah, it is zero. Either subtract 1.5 from that first number or um, multiply zero by 1.5 to still get zero. Okay, so now things get tougher because we're gonna write down these very general formulas here. So a recursive rule, remember, is the one that refers to the previous number in the list. And they almost all the time start off like this. S sub n is equal to S sub n minus 1, and then we got to put some further instructions. But recursive almost all the time starts looking like that. So in English, what I have so far is that if you want to get the, the current term, you take a look at the previous term and you do something, and we got to figure out what the something is. What do we do to the previous term to get the current one? Is we add 1.5, right? That's what we did to the previous term to get the next term. So that right there is what we call our recursive rule. Yes. So uh, in English, this says to get the current term, we take the previous term and add 1.5. That's what I need us to start getting uh, good at, is translating the sentence, the purple equation, into what is it really saying in English? Oh, it's just saying if you want the current term, look at the previous term and add one and a half. And that was one of our ways to do this. But then in the next blank, we're looking for an explicit rule, which means you're not allowed to refer to the previous number. You have to give me a formula for SN that doesn't refer to any other number in the sequence. So I think we need to use Zeke's idea here. What did we do to the top row to get the bottom row? Is we multiplied by 1.5. So we take the n and we multiply it by 1.5. Okay. Are we clear on the difference between the recursive and the explicit rules? All right, moving on to number eight. Uh, who's our next reader, Dave? I should say. Arithmetic. Yeah, so if the rule is just add the same number over and over again, or subtract the same number over and over again, it's a special kind of sequence and it's called an arithmetic sequence, where we just keep adding the same number over and over again. So what was the common number that we kept adding over and over again here? It was 1.5. So that's what made this particular sequence an arithmetic sequence. Whereas if you look up here, uh, look at my yellow numbers in the bottom row, 
How much can you add to the first number to get the second number in the bottom? It's three, yes? How much do you add to the four to get to the nine? It's five. Is it a consistent sum that we keep adding? No, so this is not an arithmetic sequence. Okay, it's got to be something consistent where you keep adding the same number over and over again. Okay, number nine gives us a different table. Here are the numbers in the bottom row, 5, 10, 20, 40. And let's see if we can start by filling in that blank, G5. So does anybody see a way that we can go from one number to the next? So we're multiplying by two. Everybody buy that this is a consistent multiplier sequence to keep times two on the bottom. And so that means that G5 is 80. Okay. okay, so that's all well and good. How about G0? It is 2.5 because if multiplying by two gets you further to the right, then if you want to go one spot to the left, you better divide by two. So take that last, the first number, five, and divide it by two, and we get two and a half. Okay, so far so good. <clears throat> We're now going for the recursive rule. What I mentioned before still holds true. So can you write down the beginning of the recursive rule, even if you don't have the full thing? But there should be some symbols equals some symbols. And like I said, it almost always starts the same way. What's the first symbol? It is G sub n equals gn minus 1 and then further instructions, right? So it's always got to say, to get the current term, do something to the previous term. So that n minus 1 is just so common. And our, yeah, our rule here was to take the previous number and multiply by 2. So that's the recursive rule. Ricky. So the n minus 1 is just our way of saying, if you want to go to a term that we're calling n, you need to go one term prior. <clears throat> okay, so that's the recursive rule, and it's fine. In this case, it turns out there is also an explicit rule, even though it might not be as clear as in the previous example. So I want to know, is there something that I can do to the number 4 that will give me the number 40? Well, I mean, I, I could add 36, but that's probably not a consistent thing. I could multiply by 10, but that might not be a consistent thing either. So we need a consistent rule that will get you from the top number to the bottom number. Times what? Yeah, this one's a lot tougher. There isn't always an explicit rule. In fact, most of the time there isn't. There is for this one. But it's not nearly as easy to see as the previous one. So uh, let's say this. Um, what could I multiply the 4 by to get the 40? So we can multiply that 4 by 10, OK? Fair enough. How about the 3? So 3 times what will give me? Wait a second. It won't. Uh, sorry, these numbers are jogged off just a tiny bit from what I thought they were. Okay, um, 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 okay, so let's do this. I want to take each of these numbers in the bottom row and divide by five. Five goes into all of them, yes? Okay, so let's divide by five and just see if there's any pattern hidden underneath these numbers when we take that common five out of all of them. So the new numbers, when we divide everything by 5, so I'm just going to keep the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 at the top. What are the new numbers when I divide by 5? 1, 2, 4, 8. Let's do one more. Uh, 80 was the next number. If you divide out of 5, it is 16. Do you see a, a, a pattern under there? Yeah, so, so we could still see it as multiplied by another 2, because that's what these numbers are, just multiplied by another 2. But if we translate these numbers one last time, uh, 8 is really 2 to what power? 8 is 2 to the third, right? 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. How about 16? 2 to the 
fourth. How about four? Is two squared. Two is really two to the first. One is really two to the. Is it? Two to the nothing. Yeah, it's just this kind of random looking arithmetic fact is that any number raised to the zero power is one. Yeah. It's sort of a definition. You could type it on your calculator, two to the zero, it will say one, no problem. Looks funny, but it's how we define any number to the zero. Okay, so then I feel like if I just bring my fives back in, then I'm good. So we divided everybody by five, right? So I could bring these fives back. And so for example, how much is five times two squared? Is 20, right? Five times four is 20, that's exactly what we had. And how much is five times two cubed? That's five times eight, which is the 40 that we had. So these numbers in the bottom here, they look like this when we pull out the five and recognize that everybody's two to a power. So then finally, last step is can you relate just the numbers in the top row to the powers on the two. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like these powers on the twos are just off by one from those numbers in the top row. So I think we can write down our formula here, which says the following. G sub n equals, okay, all of them have what consistent? All of them have what in them? is five, and then times two to something, we just have to find the something, and it's, it's either n minus one or n plus one, let's, let's think about it. So, mm -hmm. so you, get, you gotta take the number in the top row and build the power, yeah, so that three in the top row becomes a two, so minus one is the explicit rule. That was tough, wasn't it? I wasn't expecting that. I don't know if you guys were prepared for it. Okay, so what we can see is that oftentimes if there's a, a recursive and an explicit, the explicit is uh, much harder to find. That is not uncommon, is that explicit rules are very hard to find. Okay, let's move on to number 10. Right now we're just still kind of gaining comfort with the symbols. Uh, we're going to uh, Sam. 10? Yes. Good. So what was the multiplier for all these numbers? To get from one to the next, we multiplied by two, and that's a geometric sequence because we keep multiplying by the same thing. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to move on to the next page. And there's this thing called uh, traffic jam. So this will be the first part of the activity. But let's make sure we're all aware of the rules of this game. So here's the idea. We have uh, these three guys on the right-hand side and three guys on the left-hand side. And they basically want to change places. The guys on the left want to end up all the way. The guys on the right want to end up all the way on the left. And these three guys on the left want to go all the way to the right. And so here are the rules of the game. Each of them is basically standing on a like a platform. And uh, what you're allowed to do is take one step forward if the platform in front of you is open, or you could jump over somebody if the platform just on the other side of them is open. So you can, it's like checkers. You can either move one square, or you can jump over as long as that person is right in front of you and there's an available platform. And doing just those moves, we're allowed to, we're, we're gonna be able to get these guys to trade places. You can't ever go backwards. Um, and so we're gonna play this game, but before we play it with the three people, Let's play an easier version on the next page with two people. So I'm going to give you guys some markers uh, that you're going to use for people. Uh, let me zoom out just a tiny bit here. Okay. All right, so let's check this out. Uh, let's suppose that we have uh, these two X's and these two O's. So far, so good? Shh. It's just a smaller version of the problem I gave you. Here we have two people on each side instead of three. Okay, so all we want to do is switch these guys. So one thing we can do is uh, take this last guy, and what can I do? How can I, what's the only way I can move this bottom guy? Is to jump him over there. But now nothing else can move. 
So that was a very bad move. Shame on you. Right? We can't do anything. We can't move backwards. And the only open square is behind somebody that can't ever go backwards. So that was a bad idea. So let's not do that. So how about we move this guy up to there? You don't need to take notes on this. We're just making sure we know the rules. You'll have a chance to play this game plenty. So a uh, good move or bad move if I move that guy forward one square. That's bad because now we're all blocked up again. So now we're going to jump that X. And jump the X to there. So far so good. Okay, and now you have two choices. Let's make sure everybody's clear what the two options are. What are the? So you can jump anybody over anybody as long as they're right next to each other and heading in the right direction. So I could move the O up. That's one possible move. Or I can move the X down. Those are the only two moves, right? Okay, so let's try one. We're going to move that O up. Now there's only one possible move at this point. What is it? It is to jump that X. And now there's uh, still another move left. What can I do? I could move the O up and then finally he's home, but then we're stuck. So that wasn't such a great thing to do. So let's put this guy back and we'll put this guy back. So what's the right move now? We got to move that X down. If we move the O up, we ran into trouble. We, we, we went down that branch. So we're going to bring this guy down. Now what's the only move? We're going to jump that O. Now there's two choices here. You can move the X down or jump the O. Jumping the O is a good idea. So let's jump the O. Then this X can go home. And then we can jump the second X. And then finally move the O up. OK, so everybody see that's how we do it? OK, here's what I want us to do. In addition to just being able to get these guys to all swap, I need to know how many moves it takes. That's what we're really doing. So we didn't count here, so you guys are going to have to replicate this on your tables. But a move is either walking somebody forward a step or jumping somebody. Those are the two kinds of moves. And we just have to count how many total moves there are. You don't need to separate those moves, OK? So I'm going to give you guys some pennies and some dice, and you're going to play this game with uh, first one person on each side, then two, then three, then four.